Good morning again. Good morning. I uh, so appreciate uh, your pastor, by the way, and I know that you do, and uh, so grateful for him, uh, Adam's love for the Lord, and for his word, and uh, for his family, for the church, and uh, really ministry that goes beyond that, because uh, as you know, he serves on our executive board at the SBCB and then serves our Southern Baptist Convention as a chairman of one of the committees there. And so, uh, so grateful for his investment. And let me just say, I am excited uh, to be at Goshen because this is a historical church. So as I pull up, um, I think I saw it dates back to 1872. Is that right? 1872? Any charter members here? <laughs> <laughs> well, Brother Haney. Wow. What a, what a blessing. What an encouragement he is, right? Oh, my goodness. He greeted me this morning and said he's an elder. And I thought he meant an elder of the church. And he did mean that, but he also meant elder. And uh, so I appreciate that. And I also told him that I am the oldest elder in my church. And he says, well, I've got you a couple of years. <laughs> so that, 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 is, that is so true. But this is a great historical church. It reminds me of the church that I pastored for 14 years in a little place called Zunai, Virginia. Ever heard of that? Yeah. Okay, somebody? Okay, I hope you didn't get a ticket going through there. But uh, it's a, a series of towns between Petersburg and Suffolk if you're heading to the beach on the old route, not going 64, but going 460. And so it's a little, little town. And our church dated back to 1806. So it was, it was pretty old, right? And so uh, we also, uh, Adam went through the process of renovations over the years and then of course some building projects and that kind of thing. So it reminds me of being at home and let me just say not just the building, not just the setting, but the warmth and the hospitality that you bring as we welcome each other to worship this morning in the small group in Sunday school. So thank you for, for that warmth and hospitality. So I, I began to wonder why Adam asked me to, to speak this morning. And then I thought, well, maybe it's because of my role with the convention as the uh, state director of evangelism. And um, because I've got to tell you, as we meet across the country, uh, Southern Baptists in the last few years, baptisms have been in decline. And we're trying to wrap our head around all of that. Why is that, why is that the case? I mean, after all, we have a lot of resources available to us. And I started thinking back in my time of ministry, we've used the Roman road, we've used faith, we've used sharing Jesus without fear, we've used gospel tracts like the four spiritual laws, the ABCs of salvation. Uh, there's a story video that's in multiple languages. More recently, the three circle uh, gospel conversation. There's apps for your phone, uh, obviously. We have the tools and we have the resources. We even have the strategies. And I see in the hallway, who's your one? And that's one of the newer strategies that the Southern Baptist Convention, the North American Mission Board, very specifically under the, the leadership of J.D. Greer, who was the president at the time, pray for five and then ask the Lord, who am I going to, who's the one that I'm going to share the gospel with? And then the SBCB, uh, four years ago, introduced what's called Bless Every Home, where you would intentionally get prompted to pray for five neighbors on a daily basis. And as you begin to pray, the Lord opens your eyes to be able to care. You begin to pray. It's prayer, and then it's care. You care for your neighbors, and then you share the gospel with your neighbors, and then you disciple your neighbors. And so that's bless every home. So you can see there's plenty of resources available, right? So why aren't baptisms and conversion numbers rising? I believe it's quite simple. We have personally stopped sharing the gospel. We've stopped. We've stopped intentionally telling people about Jesus, what he's done for you, what he's done for me, and what he can do for them. And so this morning, I wanted us to consider the story of Philip and his encounter with the Ethiopian. And it's here that I think we will glean some key steps to intentional evangelistic encounters. Okay? I promise you, I did not know that you were having evangelism training after church today, right? So when Adam said, hey, can you send me an outline? Can, can you send me your text earlier in the week so we can put the bulletin? I said, well, sure. And he replied to say, perfect. I didn't know what perfect meant, 
but this is definitely a lead in. So, uh, Lee, I'm excited about uh, you all this week, and particularly the training and the opportunity the Lord's going to give you on Tuesday. So, so I've entitled the message this morning, It's Your Move. Because we're going to see in just a few moments that Philip knew that it was his move, it was his time to obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit, to confront the Ethiopian with conversation that's going to lead to gospel conversation. Let me just ask you, does anybody like to play chess? Checkers? Checkers? Yeah, that's me. I think chess, you've got to be way too intelligent. And uh, with, with checkers, it's just kind of luck, you know, that kind of thing. But, I, you know, Cracker Barrel, you're going to sit and play checkers, right? And so what I like about it is it's, it's you and one other opponent, right? And so you're sitting there and you're making your move and, and then you're strategically thinking about what's the next move. And so I'm waiting for whoever I'm playing and they are thinking and overthinking and rethinking what they're going to do and I'm like, what do you think I say to them? It's your move, right? It's your move. I'm, I'm so impatient. It's like, it's your move. So I wonder how many times the Lord has said to me, Steve, it's your move. It's your move to go up to someone and engage them in conversation that will lead to spiritual conversation. How many times has he said it's your move and yet I hesitated and just simply then disobedient. And yet I know that I'm supposed to be salt and light to a lost and dark and dying world. And so I, I don't know, as you're looking at the world today, our pastor has been preaching a, a message, a, a series on an upside down world. What seems to be right is wrong. What seems to be wrong is right. We live in a dark and dying world. Don't you think it's time for us to shine the light a little brighter? Don't you think it's time for us to shake the salt out of the shaker? In the, early, in the early church, the salt was coming out of the shaker and the wind was blowing it and the spreading of the gospel was happening in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. We read in Acts 1.8. Today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 8. And it centers around four men, Saul, who is the zealous persecutor, Philip, who is a faithful preacher, Simon, the sorcerer, the clever deceiver, and then the Ethiopian, who is a concerned seeker. And so today we're going to be focusing on Philip and the Ethiopian. And so throughout the book of Acts, we learn much about Philip. And I want us to concentrate just for a moment on Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. Let's, let's see what we learn about Philip here. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. So from these verses, what do we know about Philip? Well, we know that he was... A chosen deacon. By the way, that's not a bad thing, right? It means to be a servant. He grew in his ministry. He gained the respect of people. They listened, they heeded what he spoke. We know that he was chosen by God to be a disciple in Samaria, which, by the way, had been prohibited in the past. Only Jesus uh, and John the Baptist had ministered there previously. He was a preacher, which meant that he was a messenger. Obviously, he was a good communicator because the word preaching in verse 4 means to preach the gospel, to evangelize. And then the word in verse 5 actually means to announce as a herald. So Philip was God's commission herald to deliver his message to Samaria. So to reject the messenger would be to reject the message and reject the authority of the one who sent him. And that was God himself. I probably need to say that in a, a different way. To reject the messenger, to reject Pastor Adam, the preacher, is to reject the message of the one who sent him, who was Almighty God himself. That's a good word right there, right? Yeah. Philip was also a miracle worker. 
He demonstrated God's power as people were delivered from demon possession, and those who were paralyzed and sick were healed by his ministry. But the focus here is not on the miracles. The focus here is on the word of God. The people heard and they heeded the word of God because they saw the miracles. And believing the word, they were saved. You see, miracles don't save people. The gospel does. Philip was an effective evangelist. People responded to the gospel. And they, when he shared the good news, they responded. He, they responded to um, his preaching. Finally, he was a bridge builder. So the gospel has now moved from the Jewish territory into the city of Samaria, where people were part Jew and they were part Gentile. And so God used Philip to build this bridge between two estranged people groups, and they were united now as believers in Jesus. So God used Philip to move into this pioneer territory, this unreached people group, to share the gospel and unite believers. Folks, here is another example that the gospel is for all people. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter what race you are, what color of your skin, your background, the language that you speak. The gospel is for everyone. Amen? So Philip was this bridge builder. And I believe we need more Philips today, don't you? So for our remaining time, we're going to be examining this encounter with Philip and the Ethiopian. Now let me just tell you. If you're looking at the outline this morning, your pastor probably gives you three points normally, right? It shows 10, but I promise you it will be fast. Where's the clock? You don't have the clock? Okay. When the pizza is delivered, I'll know it's time to stop. Okay. Acts chapter 8, beginning with verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert place. And he rose and he went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in the chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he is led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, in some translations, you will hear, uh, read verse 37, in others it's implied then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns, until he came to Caesarea. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word this morning. What a great, what a great story. So what can we learn from Philip and his encounter with the Ethiopians? If we're going to be heralds, if we're going to be messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to others in our Jerusalem, this is our communities, this is our neighbors, if we're going to make the move like Philip, and there will likely be some natural chronological components to evangelism, intentional components to sharing the gospel. Some would say that these are the essentials of evangelism. So you have the outline in your bulletin this morning. Number one, there's the prompting. The prompting of the Holy Spirit, verse 26 and verse 29. The angel prompted Philip to get up and go south on the desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. So what did Philip do? 
He got up and went, right? I mean, what would you do if the angel gave you instructions? You'd do it, right? And then in verse 29, the Holy Spirit told Philip to go and join the Ethiopian in the chariot. And what does he do? He joins him in the chariot. You see, when the Holy Spirit prompts you to go to someone, you better go. Why is that? Because the same Holy Spirit that has prompted you to go to someone, that same Holy Spirit has been drawing that person to Jesus, and he's waiting for you to make the move and join him in sharing the good news of Jesus with him. So that's why the message is called, It's Your Move. So just to keep you engaged, say it with me, It's Your Move. It's Your Move. So from time to time, we're going to say, It's Your Move. Okay? So number one, Number one is the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Number two is the observation that takes place in verse 28. So when Philip was obedient to the angel, he got up and he went down to the desert road and he saw or he observed the Ethiopian man, a unit, high official, who's in charge of the queen's treasury, the entire treasury. So a pretty important person, right? So what did Philip observe? The Ethiopian is sitting in the chariot. He's reading aloud from the prophet Isaiah. So I asked you this morning, would you find it strange to find someone sitting in a restaurant, in the break room at work, or on a park bench, or on a bus, and they're reading aloud scripture? Would you find it to be strange? Unfortunately, I think we would. But at the same time, I think I would be encouraged by the fact that this is someone who is reading the word. They're wanting to know more about God. They're wanting to know more about his word. As a matter of fact, the scripture said that the Ethiopian had come to Jerusalem to worship, and at the time, he's going through the motions of worship because he is not saved at that point. He's seeking and he's searching, but he's not saved. So let me tell you something that you already know this morning. There are many people who go through the motions of worship, but they've never been saved. Did you hear that? I mean, there could be some even here this morning that have gone through the motions of worship, but in your heart you know that you've never been saved. And if that's the case, it's our move to go to those people that the Holy Spirit draw, drew to be here in the first place this morning. So there's the prompting, there's the observation, then there's the obedience in verse 30. In obedience to the Holy Spirit, Philip runs up to the chariot and he hears him reading the prophet Isaiah. You see, there, there's some of us who are willing to observe folks from a distance, but when the Holy Spirit tells us to move closer, get closer to that person, get closer in a relationship to them, what do we do? We do the opposite. We back away. We retreat. But Philip was obedient, and he got close enough to be able to be in the presence of the Ethiopian and even hear what he's actually saying and reading. You see, I, I think we're so concerned that we're going to invade someone's personal space that we would risk being disobedient to the Holy Spirit than to intentionally draw closer to that person. Uh, we don't want to interrupt them. Uh, you know what Satan is telling us, right? We, we don't want to interrupt them. It's none of our business what they're doing, what they're reading. That's what Satan does, right? So let me tell you, if the Holy Spirit tells you to get closer in relationship, it is your business. It's my business to be obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So, whose move is it? It's your move. In a minute, we're going to reverse that and say it's my move, right? Okay. So here we are at number four. Anybody counting? We're at number four. The engagement. You have the countdown, right? Verses 30 through 34. Philip begins to engage in conversation, and he asks a question. Do you understand what you're reading? I mean, if you want to start a conversation with someone, it might be wise for you to observe them and, and then ask them about something that is pretty obvious that they're interested in, right? So Philip knew that the Ethiopian was interested in the prophet Isaiah because that's what he's reading. But I'm not sure that Philip was ready for the answer to the question because the Ethiopian actually answers the question with a question of his own. He says, how can I understand what I'm reading unless someone helps me or someone guides me? As if to say, Philip, will you help me? So he invites Philip to join him in the chariot. Now, here's the real sign that someone is interested and willing 
to be engaged in conversation with you is when they invite you into their charities and they invite you to sit with them at the restaurant or in the break room at work or in the park bench on the bus starbucks you know so the ethiopian is reading and this is what he's reading he was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb is silent before its shearers, so he does not open his mouth in his humiliation justice was denied who will describe his generation for his life is taken from the earth so the Ethiopian asked Philip another question. Who is the prophet Isaiah talking about here? Is he talking about himself or is, is he talking about someone else? Folks, when people ask us questions about spiritual things, they are engaging us and wanting us to assist them with the answers. And guess what? When they ask, it's your move to get the answers, right? And let's face it, we might not know the immediate answer, just to be honest. But we know where to go, don't we? We can point them to God's word, absolutely. So Philip makes the move, and he begins, number five, the gospel conversation. We're halfway there, the gospel conversation. So Philip tells him the prophet Isaiah is not talking about himself. He's talking about Jesus. And he proceeds to tell the Ethiopian the good news of Jesus. And he starts right there in that passage. You see, Isaiah 53 is the passage that he's reading the prophecy of the suffering servant. Isaiah is describing the Lord Jesus in his birth, his life, his ministry, his substitutionary death, his victorious res re resurrection. So Philip is, not, Philip is able to make the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's sharing the gospel with the Ethiopian. You see, for, for many years, Adam, I think Southern Baptist, I think we've been measuring probably the wrong thing. Uh, we celebrate churches who baptize lots of people each year, and we're quick to pass judgment on churches that maybe baptize one or just a very few. As a matter of fact, we kind of use that as a measurement uh, for church health. I'm beginning to think that what we need to measure is our obedience to having gospel conversations. The reason I say that is we have to trust the Holy Spirit to do the convicting, to do the leading, and then the results will happen. We've just got to be found faithful. Now that we see that really truly we're not sharing the gospel. So SBCB, you know, challenged us four years ago about uh, Bless Every Home. And as I mentioned before, we begin by praying. And I get prompted each morning to pray for five neighbors. And I will tell you, as a result of that, I didn't know my neighbors really before. And I began to prayer walk and I began to pray for them, know them by name, began to see some things, observe some things in the yard. Maybe it was playground equipment or something, so I knew they had children. Or maybe it was a wheelchair ramp, so I knew that there was a need, uh, that kind of thing. And then we began to be more intentional. My wife and I, we would take things to the neighbors, welcome new neighbors to the community. We put a card on the loaf of bread and gave them our contact information. Uh, here's my cell number, here's my wife's number. We counted the privilege to be your neighbors, and we would love to pray, with, uh, pray for you if there's anything we can pray for. And so we had this dear couple, just uh, three doors down. He was a uh, pharmacist. Uh, she was an Indian descent, and she texted my wife almost immediately and said, we've been praying uh, for uh, to be able to conceive a child, and we've been struggling. Would you pray for us? And uh, so that opened the door. So we began praying, we began caring, right? And then we began to share the gospel with that family. Now, I'm not saying it was because of our prayer, but just a Christmas later, we get the Christmas card with a picture of their precious little girl uh, that the Lord had blessed them with. I say that to say the gospel conversation has to be intentional, then sharing the gospel after we prayed, after we cared, then we shared the gospel with them. And uh, I think sometimes we measure based on the baptism, uh, just to be honest. And I think our faithfulness in sharing the gospel is so, so important. You see, J.D. Greer, when we talk about who's your one, it's one thing to pray for the five, but then you've got to commit to share that one. And what I like about who's your one is, I think a sequel should be who's your next one. Because after you share the gospel with one person, don't stop sharing, share more, right? So, you want to be a part of a healthy church that's growing. 
see people come to Jesus, start caring for your neighbors, start caring for them, start praying for them, start sharing the gospel with them. And the result, here we go. The decision, number six, verse 37. This is the implied verse. As Philip explains the verse to him, the Ethiopian begins to understand the gospel because the Spirit of God is opening the mind of the truths of God. So he must have said, I do believe, right? And we'll see why we believe that he, he said that. You see, it's not enough for a lost sinner to desire salvation. He must also understand God's plan of salvation. Philip shares that Jesus is the spotless lamb that was slain for the world. He's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Philip knew that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the Ethiopian decides to believe on the Lord Jesus. How many people are waiting on you and I to tell them the good news so that they can decide for themselves to follow Jesus too? Now, how do we know that the Ethiopian believed on the Lord Jesus? Number seven is the evidence. The evidence. So as Philip and the Ethiopian are traveling down the road, they come up to some water, and the Ethiopian says, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? And Philip's answer must have been, nothing can keep you from being baptized if you believe. Because they stopped the chariot, and they both went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. You see, there are many people who have trusted the Lord Jesus, but it's not, never been evidenced in their life by a public profession of faith through baptism as a symbol of washing away of the old self and sin, rising up in the newness of life in Jesus. And that could be you today. I did walk in to see the renovation a little bit ago and recognize, guess what? You still have a baptismal pool. They did not take that out, right? And so if you've never been baptized and you have trusted the Lord Jesus, I would encourage you as a public profession to do that. It's your move. Number eight, departure. Verse 39. Verse 39 says that when they came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit carries Philip away. Now, what do you think that means? What do you think is happening there? I think it means that the Holy Spirit is moving Philip on to the next assignment, the next divine appointment. Because we, we read that he appears in Azotus, and then he's preaching the gospel in all of the towns until he comes to Caesarea. And so that just reminds me of fishing to a degree. Any, any people like to fish in here? Yeah? All right. So you're, you're out fishing, and you catch a fish, and then all of a sudden you've been out there for several minutes and another hour, and the fish stop biting. What do you do? It's your move. <laughs> yeah, it, it's your move. You either go home or you, or you go to another spot, right? So you pick up your anchor and you go to another place, right? And so you fish for more fish, right? So you don't give up on that. So what does that tell us? You see, once you have shared the gospel with someone and they decide to follow Jesus, don't stop fishing. Keep fishing. Fish for more souls. Move on to another spot. Move on to another person that the Holy Spirit is leading you to. I think that's what J.D. Greer has been saying about who's your one. So once you share with the one, who's your next one? And move on. Some of us have been fishing in the same pond, so to speak, and the Holy Spirit is trying to move us to new ones. And maybe, maybe that's to another neighbor. Maybe that's to another co-worker, to another friend whom the Holy Spirit is preparing to receive the word of God through you, and you know it, it's your move. Then comes the rejoicing in verse 39. Rejoicing. The Ethiopian did not see Philip any longer. Remember, the Holy Spirit's taken him away, but he went on his way rejoicing, which, by the way, is another evidence of his salvation. Because when we have experienced our sins forgiven, our darkness turned to light, our night today, ashes to beauty, Sorrow and joy because of what Jesus has done for us. We too will rejoice much like the Ethiopian did. But notice the Ethiopian is no longer dependent on the one who led him to the Lord for his joy. Because now his joy is in the Lord Jesus. And now he has experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit to help him understand the scriptures. He's not relying on Philip any longer for discipleship. And that just reminds me that we really truly have no excuse we're not being followers. They're not growing in our faith. Uh, we have God's word. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit to help us comprehend it, now to understand it, and to apply it 
to our lives. And then, as someone has said already this morning, we are not just hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word as well. So what happens when we're willing to make the move like Philip did and be obedient to where God is leading us and to the person that he has sent to us? Number 10, we're there. The gospel is spread. Philip moves on to preach the gospel in other towns. Folks, we want to be found faithful in sharing Jesus in Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania. Obviously, you've got an opportunity coming up on Tuesday. But the Holy Spirit leads us to other places to herald the good news. Maybe it's somewhere else in Virginia. Maybe it's the Appalachian region. Maybe it's Washington, D.C., where the world comes to us, right? Uh, we've had partnerships uh, in our state with Barcelona, Lithuania, Montreal, Haiti, Puerto Rico. Um, for me, more recently, it's been Japan. Um, and let's not forget Paris. <laughs> France needs Jesus, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But God is on the move, and he invites you to join him. If you've ever taken experience in God with Henry Blackaby, his great work, he says, God is at work all around you. All you have to do is be willing to join him in the work. And so do you believe that God is still at work today? Do you? Yeah. And if that's the case, then guess what? It's your move. It's your move. So let me just kind of summarize these essentials of evangelism this morning in this way. The Holy Spirit could be prompting you to someone. I dare say that as we've heard this story this morning, maybe the Lord has placed somebody on your heart already. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a friend. But the Holy Spirit is prompting you to someone. And I want to encourage you as we look at this story to observe them from a distance and begin to pray. Begin to pray. Obey the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit prompts you, go up to the person and engage the person in conversation. And from that conversation, transition into gospel conversation. I think that's where we miss it a lot of times. We're, we're willing to talk about anything in the world. Politics, the weather, but how do we transition from general conversation to gospel conversation to tell them about Jesus? Provide an opportunity for them to make a decision. Lead them to be baptized as evidence of their new relationship. Connect them with a local church. Certainly you want to invite them to be a part of Goshen, but maybe Goshen is not right for them. Lead them to a congregation of believers. And then move on to the next divine appointment. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, it's laid out right there for us, isn't it? You see, we need more Phillips today. And the reason we need more Phillips today is because we have more Ethiopians that need to hear and believe upon and trust the Lord Jesus. It's your move. It's my move. 